All right, Chair Jennings, um, we wanted to start with you giving a welcome to our working group, um, and then I will take it over for a little bit and kick us off in terms of our purpose and agenda for today. Thank you, Danielle. Um, so I, I just wanted to let all of you know how pleased I am to uh, be on this team with you. Um, I bragged on each and every one of you yesterday at the SACOG board meeting. Um, and I was bragging on you because they used the term in my remarks about um, our kickoff meeting that we had. And I used it because in football, you start the game off with a kickoff. And the way that you know that you're gonna be successful in the game is that you take it to the house. And I let them know that our meeting, we took, it to the house. We just accomplished great things and had a, a really, really good meeting, getting to know each other, which we're gonna do even more today. But I just wanted them to know we have a great team. And I want each one of you to know that I'm happy to be a part of this team and that each one of you are on this team working with us. And we are not only gonna take it to the house, but we're gonna do something the Kings couldn't do yesterday. We're gonna win, we're gonna win the series, <laughs> right? And then we're gonna show the Kings that how it's done so that they can win the series and they can keep advancing through these playoffs. But I just wanna thank each of you for your time, your commitment, your energy, your professionalism, everything that you bring to this team to help us to do this important work. I wanna thank you for that. Thank you for your time. Most of all, the most important gift that we give is our time. And I wanna thank you for that. And uh, we've got a great agenda. I've gone through the agenda. I'm looking forward to focusing on the outcomes for 2023 with you for the rest of this year. And I just wanna take this time to welcome you. So with that, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Danielle and she's going to get us started. And I'll be back uh, again to um, go through the opening activity with you. Chair Jennings. Um, yes. And Danielle, uh, just hoping that we could go ahead and take roll if that's okay with you. And then we could uh, get a motion for our consent item, which just allows this meeting to be held remotely. Please, let's, let's take care of the business first. Thank you, okay. Lynette, for bringing us back to, to, to making sure we take care of the right business things that nope. need to be done. No problem. Okay, I'll go ahead and start with roll. Uh, let's see, starting with our SACOG board members, if you could indicate your, um, your presence by saying aye or here. Um, we'll start with Director Bulahan. Absent, Desmond. Here. Gallardo. Absent, Gog? Uh, yeah. Yes, Gialdo's here. Oh, Gialdo, thank you. Good to see you. <clears throat> Director Gog? Absent, Guerrero? Here. Harris? I'll note for the record, Director Harris is here. And I am unmuted now, so yes, thank you, okay. sir. <laughs> thank you. There's Director, always one. No problem. Director Saragosa? Here. Director Lauren? And I'll, I'll note for the record, she is here too. She is present. And then Vice Chair Soon. Here. And Chair Jennings. I am here. Thank you. And then turning to our external members, <clears throat> excuse me, not in alphabetical order, but Elisa Herrera. Present. Christine Tien. Here. Thank you. Raul Martinez. Here. Kendra Lewis. Here. William Walker. Here. Ami Barnes. Present. Shante Arroyo. Absent. Woody Deloria. Here. Marco Lizarraga. Absent. And Maria Chacon Nistet. Here. Thank you. Chair, would you like me to go ahead and read the remote agenda item? Please. Okay, this item is our um, remote meeting item, consent item on our agenda. Again, like mentioned earlier, this allows us to proceed with this meeting being held remotely. So do we need a motion, Lynette? We do a motion in a second, please. I would entertain a motion. And sure. Sir, Sir, goes the moves. Second, soon. It has been moved and second. 
Can we go by all in favor say aye? No, I'm sorry. We do need to have a remote, uh, a, a, excuse me, a roll call vote, but I, I'll be quick about it. So, all right, go right ahead. Thank you. Again, with our uh, board members first, Director Bulahan. Absent Desmond. Aye. Gialdo. Director Gialdo, could you indicate your vote? I'll come back to her. Director Gog. Absent Guerrero. Here. Yeah, I. <laughs> Harris. Yes. Zaragoza. Aye. Lauren. Director Lauren, could you indicate your vote? Okay. I'll come back to her. Vice Chair Soon. Aye. Chair Jennings. Here. All right. In Aye. Our public, thank you. Uh, Elisa Herrera. Yes. Christine Tian? Yes. Raul Martinez? Yes. Kendra Lewis? Yes. William Walker? Yes. Ami Barnes? Yes. Shante Arroyo? Absent Woody Deloria? Aye. Marco Lizarraga? Absent. And then Director Lauren, if you're there, could you indicate your vote? Okay, Mark, her absent, and then Director Gialdo. Could you indicate your vote to hold this meeting remotely? She's having technical problems, so I'll just note that she's absent. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you very much. And with and that, that, my apologies. Uh, Gialdo is I also having a little technical trouble. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And I don't okay, think you called that. on me, but I'm I too. I'm Maria. sorry, I missed you, Maria. Yes, thank you. You're in the record. That's okay, for I. no problem. Thank you. Okay, with that, I will turn it over to Danielle for the introduction and the overview. Okay, so it's good to see all of you back. Again, my name is Danielle DeRyder Williams. There's some new faces here. Um, I am your facilitator for these meetings um, along with tag teaming with members of your team. Uh, I will just briefly introduce kind of the purpose and the outcomes for our time today. Um, we're going to deep, deeper dive, dive deeper into uh, activities within the Racial Equity Action Plan uh, for SACOG, um, share a bit about progress to date, uh, how you all can get engaged um, and then give you an opportunity to weigh in with comments or questions or suggestions related to the implementation uh, of the REAP. The outcomes that we're hoping for is that you all leave with an understanding of your collective and individual roles in implementing uh, the Racial Equity Action Plan and that you continue to build deeper connections with one another. And we will continue to incorporate these opportunities for um, connection and understanding on uh, each of the times that we come together. Um, we've already done our intro overview. We'll head into our opening activity. Uh, we will review our community agreements and shared values that we built together last time, just to ground ourselves in those before we move forward into uh, discussing key and grounding terms that we introduced last time. So if you don't have your board packet in front of you uh, where we have those definitions included, please um, uh, be prepared to pull that up when the time comes. We will then uh, do that introduction to the action plan with those progress updates, uh, spend some time on what's next and what to expect as well as how you can get engaged and then have a little bit of discussion about what you need to be successful in this space. And then we will wrap up. So that is our agenda. I will hand it back over to Chair Jennings to kick us off in our opening exercise. Great, thank you, Danielle. <clears throat> so I heard earlier that um, there's some new faces on here today and that we wanna dive deeper into getting to know each other and, and I'm all about that. So I, the exercise today is one that I think you'll have fun with. Um, we want to uh, continue to build the relationships and have a mutual understanding of one another. And there's nothing that can do that more personal than our names. Um, they are usually with us for the most of our lives or our whole lives and often can tell others something about us. 
And so for this activity, I would like to have each person spend one to two minutes sharing the story of your name. It could be your first name, your middle name, or your last name. It could be a combination of those things. We'll leave it up to you to choose you know, what, how you wanna do that. And um, you could also talk about if you were named after someone or who chose your name or what the meaning of your name is, you can do anything you want, but we wanna hear the story of your name and only you can tell us that story. You've got about, I think, two minutes for each person to be able to do their do, their do, do what they do. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take somebody who starts it off and then we're gonna do a little popcorn. You'll pass it to the next person throughout the session. So you're gonna to have to put your, all, your video on so you can what see everybody and then you can pass it to somebody else. So uh, I can't see the hands raised, Lynette, but who's got their hand up to say they'd like to go first? No one's got their hand up yet. Hmm, I think they're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> so Danielle, what do you think? You think I should go first or you should go first? I'm happy to go first. And then I will kick it um, to, I think Elisa just raised uh, your hand, right? Um, so as you can see, I have a hyphenated last name, DeWriter Williams. Uh, the DeWriter part of my last name is actually Dutch. I grew up uh, in Western Michigan. And if you know anything about Western Michigan, you know that it has the largest Dutch population outside of the Netherlands. Um, and so uh, that is not how you normally pronounce it. It's de Ruther, but I don't speak Dutch. Um, so I don't pronounce it that way. Uh, so that's the story of my first last name. Um, and uh, I will hand it over to Elisa. And then I see Martha uh, raised her hand to go next after Elisa. So go ahead. Thank you. Well, I'm going to give you um, both names. Elisa, I am named after my grandfather, whose name was Eliseo. Um, and since I'm female, the female version for my mother was Elisa. And then Herrera is actually um, a, a change from De Herrera, which uh, is a name that's pretty common in the northern New Mexico, southern Colorado mountains, where my parents are from. So uh, like many families, they chopped off names or they, they made do or somebody changed it for them when they um, came here. But in our case, uh, my great, great grandparents made the choice to take off de, but that's it. Not very exciting, but that's it. So who do we say was next? Me, Martha. Hi, everybody. Martha. Hi. So um, I'm going to focus on my middle name, Alice, Martha Alice. Um, that was named after um, my aunt Alice. She unfortunately was 15 when she passed away. Um, so that was my dad's sister. And uh, she was also just a person who was um, very uh, energetic, um, athletic. Uh, she, back then in Mexico, she um, would like to play on rooftops. And that's unfortunately how she passed away. She missed stepped. Um, but I think my dad just fondly remembers um, how courageous she was and bold. Um, he always admired that about her. And so, you know, he just wanted to pass that on to me. And uh, so I was named Alice uh, as my middle name. My first name, Martha, it, there's no real signal. I don't know where Martha came from, but, um, but I just thought that was interesting um, and, and how my dad and I were pretty close. Lynette, I'm going to ask you to help us because you know you can see all the hands that are raised. Sure, you bet. Um, I'm not sure who was first, but we've got uh, Director Soon's hand raised and Shante Arroyo. Go ahead, Shante. You were definitely first, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll give you a quick um, background on both of my names. The name Shante is actually derived from the Spanish, or I'm sorry, the French name Shante. That one is spelled uh, C-H-A-N-T-E with an accent mark. Um, my mom had multiple pages in her notebook of different spellings because she didn't like the French spelling. So that's how my spelling came into being. Uh, my last name, Arroyo, uh, stems from uh, Spain, the Castile region, uh, and it means either irrigation channel or creek, depending on who you ask. Um, and uh, it's a name that holds a lot of semblance, especially for uh, my father on his father's side. Um, he left home very, very young, and so he always instilled in us the importance of our last name. Um, 
yeah, so that's pretty much it on my my side. Excellent, excellent. So who's next? I'll go Chair Jennings. Please do. So um, my last name, you know, it's, it's the, the Roman spelling, S-U-E-N. It's uh, many different ways, but it actually is synonymous uh, with Dr. Sun Yet Sin, S-U-N, which is, he was known as the George Washington of, of China. And uh, we, you know, hail from the same area, if you will. And so growing up when my great grandparents immigrated here, uh, in the early 19 or mid 1920s, they always talked about having pride in that name. And I think, uh, you know, nowadays, not as many people are familiar with it, but back then it was, it was a pretty popular name. So it was like, again, like Washington, that kind of name, but the spelling is they added an E when, uh, you know, somehow when they came through, uh, you know, customs or whatever immigration, they added an E in there. So there's many different names, S-U-N, S-U-E-N. And so it's the uh, same name. My first name is, uh, I, I think it's funny because uh, I love the movie, um, A Christmas Story. And uh, Darren McGavin was the actor. And my 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 dad, my parents, they liked that actor. I mean, they like the name, excuse me. They like the name. So, but, you know, he jokingly says I'm named after him. But if you ever watched a Christmas story during the holidays, it's, I don't know, growing up, it was a, it was a funny, funny movie, movie. So anyway, that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Who's next? Uh, Michael. Oh, you muted Michael. yourself. I, I can, yep, sorry about that. So Michael Sanragosa. So Sanragosa um, is um, Mexican last name or Spanish. It's actually um, the Latin, I guess the, the English vulgarization of Sanragosa is Caesar Augustus. So it was named, it was uh, in Aragon, Spain. Uh, Caesar, the town of Caesar Augustus got changed to Saragossa, and that's really where uh, that name uh, originally came from. But my family's from uh, Sonora in Mexico and Southern Arizona. Um, I'm the, the third Michael. Um, I don't think there's anything uh, there, just that they kept naming people Michael. Um, and since I didn't have kids, there's no Michael the fourth, and my parents would be probably mad if I named one of our puppies Michael. So I think the, the Michaels will end, will end with me. Uh, that's that's my story. Great, great. Jill, you want to go next? Uh, you got it. And I, I'm going to uh, follow up on Michael because I, I use my first name. Uh, last name, Gaeldo. My husband's last name is Spanish. Uh, they're from the Basque country in Spain and came right to Rockland a little over 100 years ago. Uh, but first name, Jill, as I'm named after my dad, Jack. Uh, my dad's a, lost him last year, retired uh, Utah Highway Patrolman. And most interesting part is my family always took in foster children. And um, my dad and mom adopted three kids. And the humorous part is I am my dad's second oldest child and the oldest of his two daughters named Jill because uh, they adopted a daughter named Jill. So that was a very interesting life growing up with my sister with the same name. All right. Interesting. Interesting. How do you top that, Desmond? <laughs> I don't top that. I don't. I, mine is uh, um, not very exciting, but I'm my first name. Richard is uh, was my father's name. And so I was named after him. But what, what I guess is a little interesting is, is that I'm the youngest of nine kids. And there was never an expectation that my parents would would name one of the children after the parents. But as um, uh, my mother was getting ready to give birth, Dr. old Dr. Fry, who delivered all nine kids at Mercy General Hospital, he told my mom, you know, I can give you something to uh, make sure your next kid is born on, on, your, on Richard Sr.'s birthday. And so I was born on my father's birthday. That's why I was named Richard. And uh, he and I were actually the only left-handers also in the entire family. So, uh, um, that, so that's that's where I got my name. And Desmond is just a uh, an Irish name. That's uh, obviously we've had for uh, generations. So that's my story. Sticking to it. Fantastic. 
great present. Maria, what you got? Maria, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry to try and unmute myself there. So, um, so yeah, so the origin of my name, my dad actually named me. Um, he spent some time in the monastery when he was a young man before he married my mom. And so he named me Maria Ann after the Blessed Mother, uh, as well as her mother, Saint Anne. So that's the origin of my my first name and my middle name, but perhaps more interesting is uh, the background on my maiden name, which is uh, Chacon. And so my grandfather was, um, he was born in the 1850s. And this is like my grandmother, my grandfather, not my great, great grandfather. Uh, and he, so he lived in the wild west. He was actually uh, on both sides of the law. He ran with uh, Pancho Villa. And he also was a deputy sheriff in Silver City, New Mexico. So uh, sometimes I'll have to fill you in, fill in the gaps of, of that interesting story. But that is a little bit uh, of the Chacon history there. Fantastic. That, I, I definitely want to hear those stories. <laughs> there might be a movie to be made after that. Raul, you're next. Yeah, thank you. So I'm uh, named after, uh, I think I'm named after my father, Jose Raul uh, uh, Martinez. And so uh, he's one of nine and all of his brothers uh, had the first name of Jose. So they all went by by, by their middle names. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I got, uh, I guess uh, my, my dad went a little wild and didn't name me Jose Raul, but named me uh, Raul Manuel. So that's uh, my name. Um, I also have, I see a Elisa is in here. My sister's name is Elisa, and she tells me that uh, my name is uh, of um, English derivation, which means uh, from Ralph, which means a uh, wolf council. So I have to uh, sit with that, uh, uh, you know, for a little bit. And, uh, you know, fun fact, uh, my name is really interesting. It's, it's really fun to go to Starbucks and see how many vowels are attached uh, to my name. So I've had four uh, vowels attached to it, but really it's the the you that gets left behind and really wants to be heard. And so it's, it's, it's why I say there's an accent mark on it because it's not Raul, the you really, it's not like Paul, the, the you really wants to get in there. So thank you. All right, that's great. Kendra, what you, what, what, tell me about the makeup of your name. Okay, so a um, couple of things. Um, I turned 50 last year and asked my mom where I got my name because I really didn't know my first name. Um, and she, my aunt Cassie, my grandmother's sister, watched soap operas. So there just happened to be a Kendra. And that was the name. My middle name is Noel. And I was born in December. Um, my maiden name is Walker. Um, and I wish I would have hyphenated my name because my father had five sisters and I'm his only child. So I was the only one of my cousins born with um, the Walker name. But my family name, my mother's maiden name is Scurry. And um, Scurries in California and Texas are, are pretty much uh, related. It's a very unique name. And I will say that I am very proud that Bri Brianna Scurry, who is the goalie for the women's soccer team is my cousin. Our grandfathers are our brothers. And she is in the African-American museum with the, the gloves that she caught that famous soccer catch with. Um, I had lunch with her our dinner with her a couple of weeks ago in DC. And um, I know that all of, of our, our grandfathers and aunts would be very proud of seeing Scurry on the back of that jersey every time she was playing. So I'm very, very proud of, of my family name. As my son would say, as you should be. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, tell me about your name. All right, thank you. Um, Besides my unusual spelling, it's not, there's not really a, I wish I had a creative answer as to how that came about. All it was is my parents wanted to be different, but it's the only thing. So I, I nothing special there. My middle name is uh, Lanier, which is capital L-A, capital N-I-E-R, which is quite interesting. And it's uh, my grandparents gave it to my um, grandfather as his middle name because it happened to be their best friends. My great grandparents gave it to my grandpa because it uh, um, happened to be their best friend's last name. And he ended up just, he gave it to my dad who gave it to me. I gave it to my son who gave it to his son. So there's five of us now. 
So I'm, I'm number three of five, hopefully many more, but that's about it. All right. I like that. Okay. Mr. Walker, you are next. Well, well, my last name is Walker, and certainly it seems to be a popular name. Uh, it, what, the real history is in my first and middle name. My first name is William, which is after my father, which is after his grandfather. My middle name is Lewis, which is L-O-U-I-S with uh, Anya at the end of it, which often I'm called Luis uh because of the french background that we exist i am from the gulf coast so i i'm really not claiming one city uh, i'm claiming louisiana alabama and all the, and florida and all three states that i have relatives in uh ironically it is a family name uh william will probably be in my family william lewis walker will probably be in my family for the rest of for the next hundred years my son is William Lewis Walker the third, and my uh, grandson is William Lewis Walker the fourth. So it, <laughs> it, it, so it is a family name. Uh, it's something that my son seems to be quite proud of. I never thought much of it, but uh, it's a name. Uh, and I love my first name and I love my middle name. And the last name has so much historical value uh, because it's two other names that go along with that. And one is Chestang and the other is Andrew. And they have quite a history in the region where I grew up at. So it's great, great you, history Rick. lesson. Great, great knowledge. Great passing that on too. Okay, Woody, I'm listening. We all are. All right. Good. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I, I missed the first the first meeting. So um, nice to, to meet you all uh, virtually. Um, so yeah, Woodrow Deloria. Um, the last name actually is is the French Canadian version of uh, Desoliers, which uh, comes from two, two Deloria brothers that came from France to northeastern Canada, then moved to Michigan. One, one moved to Michigan and settled the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. The other moved to um, the Southwest and uh, married a, a Native American woman, and um, th their son became the author of Vine Deloria Jr., so if you, if you follow um, any kind of Native American writing, that's that's a pretty pretty well-known name. Um, the, the Deloria uh, man, man that I descended from in, in northern Michigan, um, he, he was a lumberjack, so he wasn't quite as quite as well known. But I, I, I certain, certainly resemble, you can't see my picture, but I certainly resemble the lumberjack much more than the, uh, the uh, theologian and author. Um, Woodrow, uh, both my parents were, were artists in college, and I came along accidentally and... Um, Kind of changed their their career path, but they they were they were huge folk folk music fans, and so Woody Guthrie was was where the the name came from. Um, that's about it. Yeah. Outstanding, outstanding. So I don't see any more hands up, but I know everybody has gone. So okay, is that uh, Jesse? Yeah, I'll I'll go. Um, I'll I'll say that on my mom's side of the family, um, when they came over from Ireland, there's a bunch of gold. There's a bunch of Goldens in my family, uh, and uh, all the women are named Agnes, Agnes Regina, Agnes Eldridge, Agnes Elizabeth, and so on and so on. So I really dodged a bullet by not um, my family not uh, carrying that on. So thank I'm really thankful for that. Um, <laughs> and on that side, they're also uh, related to Flannery O'Connor. So um, yeah. And then on the other side of my family, you know, the Mexican side of my family, um, they they recycle the exact same names over and over and over again. So there's like 10 names and everybody has them. And um, I have a brother that's also Jesse. And there's also the tradition of no middle names. So, um, hey, um, one side is just overabundant with the wrong name. And the other <laughs> side, they just recycle them. And somehow, you know, that that. That's me, Jesse Lauren. It doesn't even take three minutes. It's very short. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> and I would just say my um, my uh, my maiden name is Rocha, R O C H A. Rocha is Portuguese, but we none of us are Portuguese. It was it came to us through adoption. So um, we're 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 cool with names. We'll we'll call you anything, and uh, we'll be called by anything. All gotcha. right, thanks. All right, so that's just it. don't call us late for dinner. That is exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. Okay, who, who's left? 
I think Chair Jennings, I don't think we've heard from Christine uh, Tian yet. Oh, I see, I see. I think she just raised her hand. Yeah, sorry for the, uh, I assure you, I'm not in the witness protection program. <laughs> she says, you know, really light back there. So um, I'll start with my last name. So my, the correct pronunciation of my last name is Tian and it means field in Chinese. So my parents came um, from Taiwan to the United States uh, in the 1950s as students. So they slipped in, even though there was the Chinese Exclusion Act, because you know they they came in as students. Um, my middle name is Zhi Yi, which uh, Zhi is the generation name. So all my cousins have that, and the Yi is is means happy. And my first name. I lucked out because my brother, well, you know, my parents were immigrants, right? So my they they called my brother Norman and they called my sister Phyllis. So I feel like I lucked out with Christine and they 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 said it was because it sounded nice. So I'm like, thank you, because I'm glad I'm not Norman or Phyllis. Anyways, that's me. Fantastic. Great history lesson. Pamela, tell me about your name. Okay. I'll her last name uh it's it's, it's pronounced Bulahan or Bulahan. um believe it or not it's filipino but it um let's see it's either means um jewels in one dialect or um or a uh, citrus fruit in another dialect i'll go with the jewels and i don't have a middle name but my mom tried to use her um like her um, her surname as the middle name because that pro that proved problems when she put her middle like uh she put T as a middle initial on my social security card. And it, I ran into some problems um, renewing my license on like real ID. So I had to use my um, birth certificate as opposed to my passport. <laughs> and so my first name, my mom didn't want to name me after like, you know, like grandmothers because either mine, either she would have named me Candida or Magdalena. So like she just stuck with Pamela. And, base, and uh, as far as my parents, my dad moved here from, I, I want to say it, it takes two planes and a boat to get here one way. So it's, the, the island is called Sikiho. And um, he moved here in like 1930. He followed his brother here. So his brother arrived in Seattle and came down here in 1921. And then my mom, like after she married my dad, and she came in here in 1961. So, but she had the weirdest career path. She, she taught first grade and then like she worked on cannery then like worked and then worked 20 years at McClone. <laughs> And that's basically it. <laughs> Outstanding. Great history. Great history. Anybody else hasn't gone that wants to go? Uh, Direct Chair Jennings, we have not heard from Ami Barnes yet. Uh -huh. I knew you were going to call on me, Lynette. I knew. <laughs> uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Ami Zanzile Barnes. I'm going to focus on the first, my first two names. Uh, Ami is um, a, a variation of Mon Ami. Uh, the word in French. Uh, my mother, while she was pregnant with me, read and saw that name in a book as it's spelled, but there's an accent on the first D uh, that I normally have, and she fell in love with that name, so that's how I got that name. Um, and uh, Zenzele, actually, I was, uh, my parents didn't give me a middle name, uh, so when I turned 25, I was in a very much in a space to learn about my African ancestry and uh, kind of reclaim that part of my dad's uh, lineage. Uh, he heralds from the island of St. Thomas of the Virgin Islands. And so I asked my parents if they would give me a middle name. I think they both didn't like their middle name. So I think that's why they didn't want to uh, bestow that pain onto me by giving a middle name. And I think they wanted to break tradition with their family. Um, and so uh, they took nine months, literally nine months, to come up with that name of Zenzele, which is uh, from the language of uh, Xhosa uh, from Zimbabwe in South Africa. And it's, um, uh, it reflects the meaning she will do it herself and one who is capable. Mm. So that's uh, the story of my two first names. Thank well, you. That, that is very apropos for you. For certain based on the work I see you doing and how good you are at what you do. So very, very, very well done. Um, I will kind of build on what you said about the not liking the middle names. Uh, my name is Richard Terrell Jennings II. 
My father, who I was named after, pronounces it Richard Turl Jennings II. So we argued about that over and over again. So I named my son Richard Terrell Jennings after my pronunciation. He didn't like the name Terrell, so he changed his name to TJ. But he then named his son Richard Terrell Jennings IV. So like some of you, that name will last for the next hundred years. Um, but I changed the name because Turl sounded too much like a turtle, uh, especially for someone who went to the University of Maryland and you know, played as a turtle. Uh, but when I was growing up, Marvin Gaye was singing with Tammy Terrell and the name was spelled exactly the same way. And Terrell sounded a whole lot better than Turl. So I just changed it. And my father was never happy with me, but hey, I gotta do what I gotta do. Man's gotta do what he's gotta do. So, so anyway, that name, um, that's, that's where my name came from. And they never called me Richard growing up because that was my father's name. They called me Ricky. And then when I got to college, I changed it to Rick because Ricky sounded too childish. And so uh, most of you know me as Rick Jennings, not Ricky or Richard. But now uh, my grandson, uh, his name is Ricky. And of course, we call him Pretty Ricky because because that's who he is, it's Pretty Ricky. And every once in a while, I'll let you call me Pretty Ricky or King Richard, whatever one you want, because both of them are nicknames that I go by. So whatever you feel comfortable with, Pretty Ricky, Richard, King Richard, I'm good with it. That's the history of my name. All right, thank you. And thanks everyone for um, taking the time to share um, all those details and history about uh, yourselves. I'm, I'm sure it was really interesting to hear um, the depth and breadth of, of experience and familial history from your colleagues. Um, okay, I'm going to move us forward. Uh, for those of you who did not um, make our first meeting, uh, we spent some time talking about values that are core to us as individuals, as well as value other folks' values that really resonated with us uh, through that process of discussing uh, you know, what, uh, what was grounding for us as individuals. And then we spent some time crafting some community agreements, which are essentially the way that we want to work together, show up in this space, the behaviors and, and practices that we wanna embody um, as a group. And so I will uh, just briefly touch on these because I want to get us to the meat of our conversation. But these were the values that really resonated with folks last time. We had openness, humor, humility, curiosity, learning, leadership, con contribution, reflection, compassion, poise, and knowledge. So these are some of the values that um, we wanna be sure to practice in this space. There are certainly many others, but these are ones that rose to the top. These are the kind of building blocks of, of our uh, culture on this working group, which is why they're bricks. Uh, we'll continue to add brick by brick um, every time. Here are the community agreements that we aligned around. No one knows everything. We all have something to learn and to, and to offer move up and move up so everyone is able to contribute. If you're someone who tends to speak a lot and take up a lot of space, you have a chance to move up your listening. If you're someone who tends to hang back um, and wait for others to speak, you have a, an opportunity to move up your, uh, your speaking, your contributions. Uh, we'd love for you to come prepared to participate and be present. Uh, practice authenticity. So really look for opportunities to speak from uh, your experience, your perspective, uh, the constituencies and the communities that you represent. Accept and ex expect, <laughs> accept and expect non-closure. I always do this to myself. I don't know why I always make this a community agreement. Um, these meetings are not uh, days and, and weeks long. Uh, and so we won't always get to uh, solve everything every single time. Uh, we will do our best to carry forward discussions into our next sessions together, um, but just kind of accept that uh, we want to be flexible to how the conversation unfolds um, and create space for, for that and for where, for where there's momentum. We want to recognize intersectionality and the difference between intent and impact. We are all bringing 
a multitude of identities to the space, a multitude of um, uh, different relationships with power and with privilege. And so let's honor the multitudes that we uh, embody as individuals and recognize that we don't always get it right even if we have the best intentions. Uh, and so we can acknowledge that we have uh, maybe have the best intentions in mind and uh, the impact that we cause through our words, through our actions um, uh, matters as well, right? Um, and so really being cognizant of that impact irrespective of the intentions behind it. Adding on to that, I think this is a nice little connection point, practice some self-awareness, right? Um, uh, being aware of our growing and learning edges, uh, the, the places that we might stumble, while also simultaneously extending grace to ourselves and to our colleagues um, through this process, and ultimately really trying to lean into compassion and recognition that we are all on this journey uh, at different starting points, uh, places and spaces and paces. Um, so that is uh, our community or those are our community agreements. Do those feel right and righteous to you all? Are we still aligned? They feel good? Just give me some little nods. This is an official vote. This is just a, just a temperature check. Okay, I'm seeing thumbs up. So that's great. Awesome. Um, so our last session, we spent time talking about some grounding terms uh, and key concepts, which are were represented in the glossary of the Racial Equity Action Plan for SACOG. And so we hope that you had a chance to read through those on your own. We are not going to go through the slides uh, in great breadth and depth today because we want to actually have some discussion. And so as a reminder, race and racial equity, those were some of the terms and definitions that we discussed. Uh, please refer to uh, the glossary and those longer definitions for these. Um, we also had de a definition for inclusion. And then we had a definition for diversity. And we also presented a graphic of equity uh, versus equality. So that's those were the terms and concepts that we uh, that we grounded ourselves in, but we didn't get a chance to fully deepen into a discussion, and so we wanted to spend some time today. So here are our discussion questions, and please feel free again to refer back to those definitions. So we're curious, and you can speak to any one of these um, as you read as you read through these definitions. Do you see anything missing from them? Simultaneously, if there's anything that you'd like to really highlight or amplify. So if you read one of them and you're like, ooh, I really love how this definition lifts up the individual impacts of X, Y, and Z, this would be a good time to lift that up. And then if there are some best examples that you've seen of any of these concepts in action, particularly racial equity or equity or inclusion, diversity, uh, either uh, in the work that you do in your community, in the context of, of policies and the communities that you live in, we would love to hear some examples that you've seen of that. And we have, um, let me just look at our time, about, 15 minutes um, for this discussion. So a, a good spacious time. Anyone want to speak to any one of these questions related to our definitions? And feel free to use the raise hand feature so I can help get a cue going. Go ahead, Ami. Uh, thank you so much. I wanted to ask if it, um, uh, is it possible to offer one or two additional definitions? Or is that something that might uh, not be purposeful for this process? So we only pulled a handful of definitions from the glossary. There are many others mm -hmm. that are in there. We just wanted to highlight a few. Um, if you want us to explore some others for our next session, um, maybe what we could do is we could grab those from you and we can incorporate them into our next meeting. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. And what I'll do is I'll put the two, I, I, just really specifically two, um, focusing on racial equity lens and a racial equity culture, I think could really round out 
the definitions that are already present, and then I'll put the source of where they come from for our consideration for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love that. Go ahead, Derek. Thanks, Sunil. I just wanted to highlight or amplify the the welcoming portion of inclusion. You know, I I, I just feel like the, the that part is is so important uh, for not only people to feel welcome, but be, being able to be comfortable and to engage. You know, it, it's it's like. By the way, I, I love the the I'll call it an icebreaker we did today. That that's that's really a new one with the names. And so I thought that was really neat. But you think about us just coming together and uh, you know, trying to quickly get comfortable with one another so we can have you know these meaningful and, and deep conversations. And so when I think about when you're out in public and you're trying to uh, you know, exude these, these things of racial equity and inclusion and trying to get someone who's not going through this training to, you know, actively participate. It's so important that we make them feel welcome because they don't even know if it, it took me, it, I wasn't even aware until I see this, that when you're in that situation, you're not even thinking about you, you might feel a little awkward being in a different place around by different people. And so I just think it's really important that we make uh, people feel welcome in in whatever space we're you know we're in at that time. Thank you. Thanks so much. There's a piece there on setting the tone for um, grappling with what can be really challenging concepts and conversations and and decisions. At the end of the day, we're all humans, and so the more that we can build that in, um, the better. Go ahead, William. Yes, um, I, I was kind of looking at the definition of rac racial equity, the term, and and one of the things I really want to hone in on is the part when 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 race no longer is being used to predict life outcomes and outcomes of all groups are improved, because I think that is one. Th I, I've been working in the workforce development space for a long time, and one of the things I, I sense is that there's this one step forward and two steps backwards. And it seems to be one group that's always kind of adversely impacted by the economy. And, and, and the economy really dictates the life of poor people in general, but it, it exacerbates the life of, of people of color and African-Americans because they're always looking at that ability to, to create assets in their lives. And those assets are very hard to come by. So it, it's like, there, there's never going to be a wholesale movement uh, uh, through the economy unless we can start honing in on not let, letting race be a predictor of, of folks' lives. Uh, and, and that's my thought, because it really is something that has been a part of uh, the economic system and, and the barriers for yeah, four, 400 years. Yeah, so. Thanks so much. And what Thank, I also hear, yeah. yeah, what I also hear in that is we don't have to create a zero sum game where gains in equity, right, create like a rolling back of something for someone else. And in fact, when we move forward equity, everyone tends to benefit. And there are numerous anecdotes and data driven examples of how that's the case. Other reflections from the group. Um, I'd, I'd like to lift up um, around the concept of racial equity, um, and I was thinking of how uh, we can add to the definition or if it can be tweaked a little bit. Um, I think it's really important, too, that when we say racial equity and how it's operationalized or how it is um, uh, done in action, that it's not just race, it's race and, it's race and gender, it's race and income. It's it's really gives us an intersectional lens to ensure that we are addressing institutional and systemic racism. Um, so I'm not sure, I think that's an important point to lift up because oftentimes folks think racial equity and they think it's race exclusive when we're leading with race, but we're also addressing other forms of oppression marginalization and disenfranchisement. Uh, 
That's a beautiful point. Thank you. Michael, go ahead. Thank you, Danielle. Um, <clears throat> I, I think back to the point that you just made, Danielle, I, I really want to underscore that in terms of, you know, it's not a zero sum game, because I think that's always the, the fright of folks that don't you know, understand necessarily the equity lens is that it somehow means that somebody is going to lose something because someone else is going to gain and is about, you know, rising everybody up. And I think that's that's an important concept for people to hopefully get to, to learn so that we're, it doesn't become an adversarial type of conversation or if we can at least get closer to that point. So I, I love that. And I think that's something we really have to sort of underline as, as we go forward. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I struggle with in my community sometimes, um, and, you know, and it's a, you know, I always like to say, like, you know, Placerville was more diverse 150 years ago. Um, and, and, you know, and it's how, how do we get back to that to that type of community again. And so I, I think um, that's a really key, uh, uh, you know, something to underline as, as we move forward in, in this process. I also wanted to um, support what um, Ami and uh, Michael just said. I think there is a lot of resistance sometimes to this conversation simply because people see it as a race conversation. And so uh, broadening that definition um, to include, you know, as Ami was saying, um, not just race and ethnicity, but, but actually including gender, identi and gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, socioeconomic, all of those different things, those are so much more broad. And um, when people see that it's not coming from just one place and that it could touch anyone at any time, I think they're more inclined to be open to the conversation. And um, also it's, it's, more, it's more inclusive of the broader conversation as well. I appreciate that. And, and one strategy towards that is having those anecdotes, right? On hand that you can point to where you can say, hey, for example, with standardized testing, right? When we're talking about kids and standardized testing, there are racialized disparities of, of um, uh, how well, right, folks of color do on standardized tests, but it's not because the issue is with folks of color, it's actually the issue with standardized tests, which have, been, which have been shown time and time again to have biases in them. And students who are neurodivergent can also struggle with standardized tests, right? And so when we think about those examples of when bias is built into systems, processes, programs, evaluations, the way that we're doing uh, our work on a day-to-day -day basis, if we can make those connections between uh, groups and across groups, uh, we can really try and transform that conversation um, away from this zero sum and really towards this kind of inclusion and moving everybody forward in the right direction. We have a couple more minutes, so maybe one other, one or two other comments um, for this discussion, and then we'll move forward. Uh, Jesse, go ahead. I'm going to have to apologize for not knowing the correct wording on this, but when it comes to racial equity, um, I have heard a saying employed that I'm going to get wrong and I need your help. It's um, nothing, I think it's nothing for us without us. Are you familiar? Uh, I, th I think that um, it's just an extension of um, what equity is that that um, when we're discussing equity, that we're inclusionary about all the voices that, that our decisions um, might affect so that we're not um, doing something without getting input from people that will be, could be, uh, it could be neutral or they could be harmed by. Does that make sense? Because I, I don't know the whole saying, but I, I think somebody on in this group has heard that saying. Nothing, I think it's, Nothing for nothing us without us. us. Nothing about us without us. That's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just something worth remembering. That's actually a wonderful segue. Um, a big component of your racial equity action plan for SACOG is really thinking and deciding what it means to do equitable and inclusive and meaningful community engagement. 
Um, and so I, I love how that uh, saying is, is a principle that we can incorporate when we start to think about the implementation of the REAP. And so what I will go ahead and do is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna hand it over to the SACOG team, Casey, um, or whoever's gonna share slides, feel free to take over. And we'll get into our introduction to the REAP and how you all might begin uh, to engage, be engaged in its implementation. So thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, Robert, would you please share the PowerPoint here? Good afternoon, everyone. And um, I have met all of you, but in this particular venue for the um, everyone who is new, I'm Casey Lazan, and I'm on your SACOG staff team here. Um, We're so uh, excited to be working with you on the implementation of our action plan. And so what I will um, say first here is, in these working group meetings um, for this year, you're on the second to four, and then we will have meetings scheduled for you next year. Um, in the meetings themselves, you'll be working on some very specific objectives um, that are in the action plan where this working group has been called out specifically to provide input and direction. And there are several other objectives that, uh, that, that SACOG will be carrying out. Uh, you will hear about the progress on these when we come together in these working groups. They will not necessarily come as individual items to you. And so what we want to do is try to um, provide different like opportunities for you if you want to be able to dive deeper into this, um, those activities to understand them and even to advise on them. So what we're doing today is um, walking through briefly the objectives within the action plan that are to support all of the goals. The, they are, if you go to the next slide, please, Robert. They are divided into three focus areas. So there are, um, there happen to be three goals per focus area. That was, it just uh, turned out that way, some elegant symmetry there. Um, there are objectives in uh, about SACOG's internal operations. There are objectives focused on our programs or those uh, those services, those activities that we uh, do working with um, external partners. And then there are objectives around board practice. Um, next slide, please. And what we will do is I'm going to have Eric Johnson talk through our operations objectives. We'll touch on them briefly and where we have started to make some progress. We'll also highlight that for you. And then when we get to the end of that, I think we'd like to have a, a discussion to answer questions and, um, and talk um, more about what you're interested in. So with that, Eric, go ahead. Thanks, Casey. So uh, in the operations area, as Casey mentioned, there's three goals that we have. And so this is the first goal. Um, and let me set this up a little bit for you. So um, when we're talking about operations at SACOG, I just wanna ground that that's really focusing on our people and our procurement. So these are all the internal operations. Uh, when Casey talks about programs, that's all of the things that SACON is kind of externally known for. But obviously, you know, we're only as good as the people we have. And so these uh, first two goals really focus on our current staff as well as our future staff. And so on this first goal here, um, I just want to reference back to the discussion you were just having about um, inclusion and the need to think about um, the intersectional identities of staff. And so one of the first things we're doing out of the gate this year um, is updating our organizational demographics. You know, we have um, basic information that we've collected from staff over time, but obviously um, we've developed a language over the last several decades to better articulate, you know, who people are and how they identify. And we wanna make sure we're um, aware of that. And we also um, can see how SACOG is representing or not representing different groups. Um, both in the people who work for SACOG, but also more importantly, for those who are applying to SACOG, we wanna make sure that they're uh, that we're an inclusive employer who is open um, to having people from all backgrounds. And so the very basic thing, right, is to start and having good baseline data. And so um, right now we're updating the information we have on um, our current staff. Um, and then we're also collecting similar information with people who apply so that in the future, we can report back to this group um, and we can internally assess, you know, are there certain groups that maybe are not showing up or uh, there's uh, disparities in people who apply versus those who go all the way through the employment 
um, pipeline. Why is that? Um, but I want to just pause there before going on to the second task in here to say that as we go through these, um, we are looking for those of you who may have expertise in the areas to identify where you might be helpful or where you have suggestions or questions about what we're doing in these areas. There's a survey um, that we'll talk about that uh, invites you to, to help us out. Um, and so we'd very much um, welcome that. So the next two uh, tasks in here are really focusing about our understanding of um, racial equity and uh, diversity, uh, equity, inclusion, and belonging more uh, generally. First of all, off, we want to ensure that we have training for our all of our staff that is foundational um, and do that on an ongoing basis so that our staff have an understanding of um, both the importance of the work that we're doing, um, but also uh, understanding that we want to make sure that it is a safe and welcoming environment for them, regardless of the job that they're doing, even if they aren't directly working on implementing the racial equity action plan. And then for those who are doing that work um, to implement the programs that you're going to hear about in a couple of minutes, we really want to make sure that they're fully equipped to do that work. And so we're looking to identify uh, a trainer or a program that can help those staff um, get that, uh, that training so that they are able to be um, uh, equipped to do the work uh, that's focusing on understanding how to work in uh, diverse communities, um, but also how to analyze the, the racial equity and other impacts of the work that we're trying to do. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so those so those areas we just talked about uh, on the first slide, those are all things that are actively underway. We're, we're well into the planning stage uh, and we'll be launching those trainings later this year. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll have that staff demographic information um, this year. Uh, and the second goal, uh, this is um, really more focused primarily on the pipeline into SACOG. And so we've done some things to broaden our outreach already, even before the adoption of the Racial Equity Action Plan. Um, and now we're focused on how do we equip our supervisors to understand um, about biases specifically uh, in the hiring process uh, and recruitment, as well as uh, you know, train them and coach them through the process of developing job descriptions. What are the real things we need to be looking for? What are things that um, either may have uh, some sort of implicit bias in them or putting up artificial barriers to people who would otherwise be excellent uh, employees to, to SACOG. Um, and then the final one here that I want to just highlight is the last one, uh, Operations 2D, where we're looking at taking our, um, we only have a, a, a relatively small staff of 60, but we, we know that it's so critical and so, um, so many of the differences between the, the broader population of the region that we have um, and the professional staff at SACOG and many other public agencies um, is the, the, um, the barriers to education as well as the barriers to entry to getting experience in the jobs. And so we really wanna focus on starting at the high school and college level. How do we ensure that those people who might have an interest uh, in working at SACOG or other local governments have an opportunity to, to get some experience and get their foot in the door. And so we're looking to develop um, a more structured internship program um, and help support uh, other agencies and groups that are also looking at that next generation to have a more diverse workforce uh, in the future. And then moving on to the third slide here, this is where we switch over to the um, procurement side. So we also, um, SACOG does a lot of contracting. Um, most of our funding that comes through SACOG is it goes out to uh, local governments or transit agencies to build or plan for projects. Um, but there are, there are you know, a sizable number of things that SACOG does internally um, with professional services, um, some limited supplies and things that we buy. Right. We want to make sure that we um, are not putting up barriers and, and to the extent we can, that we um, are working with vendors who are interested in working with government. And so one of the first things that we've started to do is work with 
a Sacramento-based association of uh, procurement officers and other public agencies to see how we can um, raise awareness in the business community and particularly um, disadvantaged businesses, uh, those that are you know, registered as disadvantaged businesses, um, about what opportunities there might be to do work with SACOG. So I'll just pause there and see if there's any questions before handing it off to Casey for the next part. Looks like Kendra and then Elisa have their hand raised. Um, I have a couple of questions. You don't necessarily have to answer them all. Sure. Um, but I'll start kind of with the last. Um, so so the, the one of my questions was how many employees? So there's 60 employees. Yes. Okay. Um, and then I, I would say just um from the just the last, the disadvantaged. Um I don't like that term. I don't like the term minority either. Um, and that's because um, there's nothing minor about um, folks who have been, who've had to survive in a system that has excluded them on purpose. So I, I just kind of wonder if we can maybe consider, I know minority and that's a term, you know, feds and all, but, you know, disadvantaged, um, just, it, it, you know, if we're really trying to bridge, we're continuing to use terms that people um, for the political folk, for the for the political and the racists that want to continue to kind of have this us or them, you know, it it is um, there has been a disadvantage, but I I don't know if there's just some other term. Um, it just feels it just makes that that group feel so much less than what makes the other groups more than them. Yeah. So that's just me personally. It's some something I'm kind of leaning into. Yeah. Um, also. Um, are are the budgets for your first two slides um, enough to um, do the work? Uh, and you don't have to answer it. I'm just putting throwing that out there. And then you know, as as it relates to some some of the training, I just want to also throw out there. Um, my husband's a retired police officer, and when he first became um, was um, in the police department in Stockton, um, he was he was hired and then put through the academy. And one of the things I was very impressed with um, in the academy is that they they went to the Holocaust Museum um, for training. Um, that was just one. But I mean, also training other than sitting in a room on a virtual or whatever, but, you know, training that that is a little bit more gauging. Now, everybody may not feel it, but I, I, I just also want to throw out there, maybe there's some other types of participatory training or engagement that would be cult, that would really um, bring value to learning about other cultures and, and racism and inclusion and so on. So Thanks. that's all I got. Thanks. I, there, if you don't mind, I think there's a couple of things that I think are helpful for the discussion for the group to, to just share back with you. So um, certainly on, on language and disadvantaged business, I, I should explain that a little bit more. So SACOG is, um, uh, more than 90% of our funding is state and federal. And so one of the limitations we have is there's this official disadvantaged business enterprise designation, as you mentioned. Um, I think that's a good flag. We don't wanna use that language to talk to community because they don't identify as that. But I think what we wanna see is, you know, using that tool, but maybe there's other things that SACOM can go beyond that. How can we help them get access to resources and get, um, access to, to grant opportunities with SACOG. Um, and then again, for, for everybody, I think training is something we want to be very thoughtful with. So we definitely are, uh, we've budgeted to hire outside training, uh, but we have not yet found, and I know there's no perfect training individually, but that idea of, you know, participatory or inclusive types of training, we want to make sure our staff really understand, you know, the import of this work and, and why they should, um, why it matters, but also the things to be aware of and understanding the, the lived experience of the communities that we're trying to plan for. So if you have ideas about that, we're very open. We're, we're still in the early stages of identifying that. So thank you for those questions. And Eric, can I, because I see we have a few hands up. So I want to make sure um, uh, to say something you, you said, like very explicitly, this, that we're going to 
go through some more of this. We'll take, we want to take this feedback. It's very helpful. And after this meeting, um, probably early next week, we will be sending a survey to all of you with the topics that each of these different objectives go through to ask if you are interested in providing advice or guidance or feedback, you can pick which topics it is that you want to weigh in on and um, you know how much of your time you are willing to share with us outside of these meetings. So if it's like you know certain number of email exchanges or a certain number of meetings, um, so we're we're hoping to uh, to to work with you on that because we um, we know that you have jobs outside of this. So with that, go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is all very good on on the um, this goal. When I look at two um, D, the learning opportunities for high school and the different things that you have uh, available, that's all good. But what I want to make sure that you know is that even though you might be doing the recruitment um, correctly and the retention and the training and everything else, there's a whole subset of populations who maybe won't apply or even if they do apply for your jobs, their resume may not look very good. So I would encourage you to identify ways that you could partner with um, training agencies, employment training agencies to make sure that they understand how to do a resume, help them practice their interview skills because they may have this set of skills and desire to do it, but that doesn't show up on paper very well or sometimes doesn't show up in the interview very well. So I think that that's one thing that you need to be aware of is also we're doing it within our community and trying to, to work with our younger high school students to help them prepare resumes and do interview preparation. So that's one a little bit further upstream issue that you might be dealing with as well. So, uh, so one, so I just wanted, so I was going to say three comments, but Casey, I, uh, you whittled it down to two. So, uh, um, you know, you know um, so one uh, point is just really appreciate sort of just sharing this with us. And again, sort of this forum in which the, you, you can start to hear some of this feedback either here or sort of in the, uh, you know, at a subcommittee or sort of an, another level. I think another sort of curiosity that I had in looking at the REAP was, and then in, in sort of looking at each one of the areas, and I know that we're not done going through all of them, is what what sort of assumptions are we making around sort of uh, change and what sort of might get in our way too? Um, and so I I didn't see that as much. You know, uh, admittedly, I, I I read some parts deeper than others, but what sort of what's the you know what are the some of the potential roadblocks or what what needs to go right um to so, so that we can see progress along you know the goals and and priorities too so maybe that's more of a a, a global comment that I'd, I'd love to maybe uh you know be a little bit more conversant on uh, as, as we progress so thank thank you I guess I should go next. I don't know who's calling. I don't oh, want to end up going. Ahead, going yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, thank you so much uh, to um, Kendra on um, pointing out that I think there, you know, she's correct. There are terms that, um, you know, created by people who probably, um, are, you know, a lot of insensitivity, um, you know, especially in the uh, Native American culture. Um, just insulting to, you know, to, and I know that the legislature has been doing what they can um, to make changes and revisions. And also, um, you know, West Sacramento is, is changing the name of, of two streets with the S word um, and including the Native American community to help us rename that street. Um, I, I, I don't know how to include the conversation as it relates to where we're, you know, what we have here to um, accept, you know, funding to achieve our goals. Um, but if we can, if we can put that, because I, I also heard it in the legislature um, earlier this week, where it's the same thing. It's tied to a, a you know, you know, the the, the statute is written um, to include, you know, the, the term Indian when it should say Native American, because that's how it's it's written in the federal, you know, um, law. You know, where, you know, where do we have this conversation um, to, you know, uh, address those things, um, you know, to, to move the needle a little further? And um, I don't have the answer here, uh, but I just wanted to at least put that 
in, in as part of the conversation, because I think as, as local government officials, you know, here and um, higher local government officials, you know, would be interested in any kind of um, interest to see what we can help identify. I think that might be a good one to pick up as well, perhaps when we get to the board practices, our third area, but I, I appreciate you raising that because it does cut across all these. Okay, if there's no other questions on operations, I'll turn it over to Casey again. Thank you. Yes, thank you all. Okay, we are now shifting to programs, second focus area. And programs are, SACOG runs, um, as I said, a number of programs. They may be um, projects, funding programs, uh, um, a lot of funding programs actually. Um, also, uh, assistance uh, to technical assistance to member agencies. So it's it's a lot of the it's all the work that we conduct with our member cities and counties, as well as transportation agencies, you'll see uh, that we're also talking about partnerships with community-based organizations here. So that's kind of to give you a sense, it's the external work that we do. So um, the in the first goal um, on the screen in front of you, uh, our, our goal of increasing engagement with community representatives, um, we have under the first, um, I'd say actually, under all three of the objectives that are listed here, we have just started in on this. Um, the, first uh, the first objective, that's 1A, um, we've started uh, organizing our community-based organization, organizations contacts list um, that we've identified. We've identified CBOs to work with through various projects and programs that SACOG has, um, has conducted over the years. And so we are, for this objective, trying to fully get organized. We are using one of the programs we're developing now um, and that you'll hear about uh, again, Engage, Empower, Implement to try to be a vehicle for that. So I would say we are still definitely in planning phases. Again, it's something that um, we'd be very interested if any of you are uh, wanting to provide again, advice or guidance on it, we will be very open to that. Um, program 1B, which is about creating, executing, and evaluating a strategic outre outreach and engagement plan for our blueprint. Um, this is our long range plan, SACOG's bread and butter. We have created and are executing on that because the blueprint is under, um, uh, it is under development now. Um, we uh, did actually last year's race equity inclusion working group provided some really great feedback on how we can tailor that outreach strategy um, to work with community based organizations to be able to reach to a, a broader um, uh, cross section of the region to to um, to groups that uh, of people who may not <laughs> definitely I would say definitely don't participate in regional transportation planning. Um, and so there's a, I, I'd say one of the, one of the activities that we have just carried out on, which, um, which was the, um, uh, we issued or awarded several mini grants um, to community-based organizations um, for them to do some targeted outreach uh, to their uh, community members they represent. And we'll be doing another one of those in the fall. So we hope to have some good, um, uh, feedback for the project itself, and also some learnings to be able to share with us. And then lastly, um, P, uh, objective 1C is an effort to strengthen SACOG's um, uh, efforts to engage and build relationships with the tribal governments in our region. We are already are in our role as a um, metropolitan planning organization supposed to do government to government consultation with tribal governments. We are through this objective trying to um, move beyond that and see if we can establish some enduring relationships with those tribal governments. Next slide, please. Okay, our second goal is about ultimately increasing funding for programs and projects that prioritize race equity and inclusion. So uh, one of those, this is um, objective 2A, uh, we want to um, uh, formalize a long-term commitment to the Engage, Empower, Implement program, which is a funding program that the SACOG board created a couple of years ago. It's the first time that they created it. Um, the program is being designed right now. 
and it is to fund engagement uh, for local government with community-based organization partners to do um, community-led um, uh, need identification and ultimately scoping of projects that could then go after funding. And then secondly, the um, Objective 2B is bolded here because I want to flag for you this particular one will be coming explicitly to this working group for your um, for your input and your guidance. And so this is um, it's not yet started. Um, this one is specifically developing a rubric for evaluating equitable engagement practices and other equity outcomes so that we can evaluate our existing projects and programs and how we're designing new projects and programs. So there's a there's quite a bit of activity happening via the other objectives that will help to, um, to, to will be inputs into this and we will be bringing that um, to this group. So again, we can get your your uh, direct work on that. Next slide, please. And then the final um, goal and set of objectives under programs is about um, a learning community. Um, that SACOG support and learn uh, from member and local partner agencies. Um, we have not yet started on these, uh, the two objectives here. Uh, I will note that we have had the benefit of other uh, public agencies in the region who are doing convenings. And so we, the SACOG staff is able to attend these and learn. So um, we hope that um, when, we, when it is does come time for us to start um, uh, setting this up that we can add to enhance the efforts that are underway um, to achieve this goal. And so I will stop there, see if there are any initial uh, questions or reactions to that before we go to board practices. Yes, Ami. Uh, thank you, Casey, for going over the program's uh, objectives. The, a question that came up around engagement does SACOG currently have a, um, even if it's working or uh, recent, a, a type of framework or approach around engagement that's, that kind of spells out the approach and working with communities currently that needs to be enhanced? I'm wondering if there's something that we could build off of. And I was wondering if you, if you could um, kind of describe what that framework looks like for us. That, that's an excellent question. We do have a public participation plan. It um, it's, covers all of the work that SACOG does, the, the, the engagement we are required to do. And then, so, it's, so it tends to be fairly high level. Um, and then we presently develop more detailed engagement plans for different projects. So I, I like the question that you're asking because it does sort of beg like, how can we create a more a framework that can be more applicable consistently across our our work right because I think that that's an opportunity to embed racial equity or have a racial equity centered approach in communicating with BIPOC communities and communities in the rural and that that are part of the overall mission and objectives of the agency you know it's kind of look what you have and then see where there is uh, perhaps maybe a racial equity assessment could be done, some key questions or drivers of what's missing in the current plan. And you can build up something that you're currently currently using, but ensuring that racial equity is part of the approach. I think that would be really um, smart and key to do that. And I mean, I think also Casey mentioned the Engage Empower Implement program. And I do mm -hmm. think this year, um, we've got a consultant on board and we have staff helping to build a framework around that. So that would be another place. I think that your, it, your comment is very relevant and perhaps mm -hmm. we can do some sharing either with the entire group or with some of you who are interested to help us on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Woody. Casey, could you go back to that, uh, the, the slide that had the bolded program kind of Yes. Two, yeah. yeah. So are you, th this would allow us to then kind of look back over time to see how, you know, in, in my world, transportation investments would would have improved the, the quality of life and, and lift, lift up communities across the region. Is that what this would, would look at? Potentially. I, I think th this is this is all very 
very open to framing, right? I think we would like to be able to look at the programs that we've run, whether, and, and I think for everyone else's benefit, what he's also talking about, um, funding programs. And so those funding programs award grants to individual transportation projects and programs, we may or may not be able to uh, assess the impact of those individual projects and programs. Um, so I think that's something, it's an open question for us to try to wrap our heads around. And I mean, that's something that, yeah, that's something I've, I've advocated for for a while with, with the active transportation program statewide, which has had a, you know, had a, a, a laser focus on, on underserved communities across the state. And I just want, I'd like at some point, it would be nice to look back and see, are these investments truly what these communities need to, to, you know, to, you know, improve the quality of life and, and, and overcome a lot of the, the inequities that have been occurring over, over, you know, decades. So, yeah, I would, I would definitely have to be for us to, to try to come up with a, a strategy for that. Thank you. Go ahead, Kendra. Feel free, feel, feel free. <laughs> yeah. sure. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions and just points. Um, I would say, um, you know, with the go community and the training and the toolkits um, is the idea, because um, terminology and language is is a big issue um and um you have a lot of and then you know race and um so um you know people who may speak a different language and have some hearing impairments um just how we communicate um to um this information um, and then, um, and I mean terms just because um, I just stepped out of the space of, of housing policy and just trying to um, get people to understand some basic things that really affect them that they just have no have had no knowledge of. So I think we have to have like terminology that is very basic and maybe having someone from the community versus a consultant, mm -hmm. you know, so maybe train a trainer um, might be something to consider. The messenger sometimes eases that um uh, it makes the partnership kind of a little bit easier and then also just acknowledging and i'm myself as i'm getting older you know there's some generational differences amongst cultures and so what my mother's generation my grandmother's generation may be mine is is not necessarily something i want is not necessarily something and i know that's complicated but but for Community, biopic communities, I think it is just is important to, you know, just kind of be aware of because um, those can be landmines in ways that you, we didn't, you can't see coming. So, you know, just, just, you know, however that is maybe just incorporating ge more generations in, in the conversation. Thank you. That's, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. William? Yeah, yeah. Casey, do you have a baseline for uh, P2B under your program management as it relates to evaluating uh, programs and, and looking at the gains, opportunities to increase? Is there a baseline? There does not exist one currently. That is part of what we would have to create. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for the really excellent questions and feedback. Um, I'm looking to see if there's any, I don't see any other hands up right now. So I will hand it over to James to talk about board practice. Okay, great. And Danielle, I realize we're running a little, a little behind, so feel free to. If this is, this is great. This is okay. perfect. Yep. The virtual kick under the table. That's fine. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, all right. So last uh, but not least um, is around board practice, as Casey mentioned. So the third goal here is around the board practice. And, you know, honestly, we don't even have this as a goal. But the fact that we have 10 of our SACOG board members here with the rest of you in this working group is, I think, a really important um sort of articulation, I think, of how important this is for the board. Um, so I definitely invite our board members to jump in on this. Um, so 
Let's start with just um, goal one, SACOG board deepening its understanding of how race, ethnicity, income, geography affects um, social outcomes of communities throughout the Sacramento region. Uh, so we've got three objectives here. Um, first being the, um, we, we have 12, well, let, let's say we have a monthly board meeting at SACOG. It's usually either 10 or 11 monthly board meetings a year. Uh, don't meet in July and sometimes don't meet in December. And for most of those, we do an in-depth workshop, about a 45-minute deep dive on a topic. And so in our racial equity action plan, we said, okay, at least two workshops uh, this coming year uh, will be about racial equity. We actually started yesterday on the 1st. We had an off-site board meeting up in Roseville for those board members who were there. And our workshop was actually about the Invest Health Initiative with the City of Roseville Health Education Council and a bunch of community-based organizations um, in downtown Roseville and core neighborhoods looking at um, health disparities, health inequities. Um, so that was the first, and we're looking at September uh, for a potential second workshop on racial equity, um, one that has that we're real interested in doing, although fitting into 45 minutes will be tough, but is sort of the... Um, the history of the region through a, a racial equity lens, which I said, you know, tough to fit in 45 minutes, uh, but we want to do something to actually have our board and all of us understand better understand a bit of the history of the region. We did a lot of work last year in our race equity inclusion working group, really around sort of 20th century redlining, restricted covenants, um, and and much of the sort of structural racism of the mid 20th century, but. Um, uh, so, so that's that's one idea in terms of the workshops uh, on on uh, objective B and C. We actually held our um, a primary refresher session for our new returning board members. We had eleven board members attending in February, uh, and four of our eight new board members, um, and everybody um, seemed very engaged. Um, and it was a good thing to do, which, uh, as we've said, should be annual. And then. Um, uh, finally, uh, we're doing uh, an annual site visit or or basically in October. So I mentioned we'd do a workshop on racial equity in September, but actually in October, um, we will hold an offsite board meeting um, probably in Southern Sacramento County. Uh, and then we will be doing a, a sort of a, a, a site visit, some sort of a tour for the board with our chair, Patrick Kennedy and his district um, somewhere in um, Southern Sacramento County, and we haven't quite decided exactly what the tour will be yet, but um, we've typically gone to other states and other regions in these uh, tours for the board, and I think the board is very excited this year and next year to really focus internally to better understand our own region across the six counties, but also how uh, racial inequities, disparities, um, lack of community engagement, disenfranchisement shows up. Um, not just in the urban core, but in places like um, City of Roseville and, and everywhere else across our region. So uh, next slide. Okay, so um, so we've made some progress on that one. Um, two more goals that are really kind of still forthcoming, uh, that the SACOG board would include racial equity impacts in its triple bottom line decisions. And I think we've we've talked about this, but by triple bottom line, uh, the board has adopted a triple bottom line framework of equity, economy, and environment, trying to not trade off, but really maximize um, outcomes by those three uh, by those three goals. So by next January, um, we are trying to formally incorporate measures of accountability within our policy approval process to pr prioritize <clears throat> collaboration with community-based organizations. This really goes back to Casey's program objective 1A um, uh, that she mentioned. And really trying to make sure uh, we're kind of starting at square one, uh, really, honestly, on meaningful relationships with community-based organizations. Um, we have some, uh, but they're very uneven, um, and we know we need to do a lot better, and which is part of the uh, rationale of the Engage, Empower, Implement program. And doing it, which will be important for our board members here to hear, not just as SACOG, but with our jurisdictions, with our cities and with our counties. Um, so we're building that capacity uh, mutually. And then second objective um, by January, 2024, establish and implement a pro process to regularly assess the equity impacts 
of proposed policy decisions through consistent application of REI best practices. That's bolded because that's something that we would really um, like to come back to the REI working group and get your input on uh, this year, both quantitative and qualitative uh, methods of assessing equity impacts. And we, I would sort of say this one is a one of those ones perhaps that's easy to say and I perhaps more challenging to actually do and do well uh, and do genuinely, but um, something we want to take on this year. And so next slide and last one. Um, so just making sure that now that we've adopted a racial equity statement of change and commitment last February and the board adopted this racial equity action plan last October, uh, that the, it doesn't just kind of go away and disappear and like, great, we're done. We have an action plan. No, we need to make sure that both this working group and our 10 board members here, but also our 31 board members, our entire board is really um, getting consistent engagement, getting updates and really involved and engaged and supportive um, of implementing our racial equity action plan. Um, two objectives. First is um, formalizing some sort of a process. We're uh, aiming for September. Uh, of 24 um, to formalize a process using uh, racial equity indicators um, to track impact of the racial equity action plan and our work in general. Uh, we're pretty good at data and, uh, and, and performance metrics and everything else, but only until recently um, did we start actually looking at them honestly by race, ethnicity, um, and, and even uh, we did a little bit more by income in the past, but, but we just did a first progress report last year by um, looking at a lot of our trends by race, ethnicity. There's a lot more we can do. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, REI working group, uh, this is really, this objective is this, <laughs> is you, uh, is this working group, which is making sure that we're trying to institutionalize and actually provide a, a support mechanism, an engagement mechanism for all of you to help us um, oversee implementation of this racial equity action plan. So. Um, that's a good one to end on, and I too will be, um, I'll be happy to answer questions. One thing just to wrap up all of this, if you take the sum total of what Casey and Eric and I just went over, um, and I think we've said this already, but really important to understand, uh, we do not believe we can just accomplish this in two years. By the end of 24, we'll do all this and we'll be done. There's no way, right? This is a, this is aspirational. It took a lot of work and involvement last year. Um, our staff got very engaged in this and very involved. We are still trying to figure out. There was a question about budget earlier. Uh, you know, we want to get some early wins. We want to we want to really see some progress. We want to get the board engaged, excited about this, have our staff engaged, make some progress. But we're not just to be clear, accomplishing all of this in uh, by the end of next calendar year. Um, so we're 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 constantly trying to figure out, which is why we have some of these dates in here. Relates to the the action plan. I think is very nice and specific in terms of timelines and what we think we can bite off. With that, I see Director Desmond with his hand up. Hi, James, thank you. And thanks, I think uh, Eric and, and Casey for the presentation about these actions. Uh, one thing James made me think about with the, I think it was 1A for the board. Um, you talked about coming to the board with, with a discussion about trends and, and uh, some of the things we're seeing in, in terms of, of transportation and land use. Uh, and their impact on, on various groups. I wanna make sure we don't forget about the very distinct uh, refugee populations we have in some of our communities within, within SACOG that are very unique and distinct in terms of their challenges and needs and impacts of the decisions um, from the decisions we make. And just really, I, I love that there's uh, such a focus on collaboration with uh, uh, local CBOs, because I think that's that's extremely important. And I know James, you and I have had that discussion. Um, and I'm certainly, you know, I, I look forward to really helping in that regard, and certainly in my district. So thank you. Great, great point, Director Desmond. I mean. Um, thank you for going over the objectives. It always helps me to hear from your own voices, you know, uh, how you express and communicate the, the goals and really brings them to life in addition to reading them. Um, the question I had regarding board practices, and again, kind of just getting a lay of the land, is, is there any expectations or requirements of board members new or, or and maybe not thought of new that has uh, communicated an expectation around racial equity, DEI? for board members in terms of um, 
their application or ability to be on the board currently for SACOP? Before they're on, you mean? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. We, we, I mean, I'll just be, and again, I've got my board members here, right? The, as I often say, the board picks us. We don't, we don't pick them. Um, that's a simple way of putting it, right? I mean, obviously, um, we want board members who are excited about our work, who are willing to engage. And again, I'll let my board members speak here. Um, the, we're a relatively, said yesterday too by our chair, a complicated and technical agency. And uh, the worst possible outcome I could have, I'm just talking generally as an executive director, is a disengaged board. Because without an engaged board, we will not be successful as an agency. So, you know, um, that's not by way of saying, right, I don't, uh, when there's vacancies on the board, I'm interested in, hey, who's who's interested? Who's been showing up? Which of our board alternates have been coming to things? Mm -hmm. Who's been coming back on our trips to D.C.? And uh, that, that that's, um, but, yeah. but, you know, I, that's not a, uh, we don't have any, it's not just about DEI or, or racial equity. There is no kind of criteria per se. Okay. Be interested in the SACOG board, other than um, you know those appointments are made by the um, the chair of the board of soups and uh, either mayors or city councils mm -hmm. chair. Right. Yeah. And and I asked that question. Um, uh, sorry, my directness. I didn't yeah, try to put on the spot or or be punitive in any way. It's just more of I see that that could be an opportunity for the systems change and kind of redefining. Uh, some of the commitments that SACOG is making at the board level, that there's that kind of, at least an expectation that this work is happening. And that leads to my my other uh, probably common question for us to, to consider is um, that capacity building around racial equity best practices for board members. Um, and that is something I think that you've identified in the onboarding um, early communications, the twice a year deep dive workshops. Um, so I see that that could be just an opportunity to further deepen the conversation and expectation, either with appointments that this is an important um, aspect of the work uh, and serving on the board of, of SACOG. So I think there's an opportunity there and that those best practices around applying, um, I'm sorry, the capacity building to build in best practices, that's a learning. And so even communicating that the SACOG board is embracing a learning culture around racial equity, I think could also be very powerful. We'll go to Jill and then that'll be the last um, of questions for now on this. Go ahead, Jill. Thank you. Um, not a question, but just a comment. And I think James uh, covered a lot of it. Um, coming from a, a council position, it, um, SACOG is an opportunity for a city or a county to send a representative because they want to participate in this collaborative process in the in our um, community. I think for the racial equity, so each city is going to say, hey, who's interested in serving on this? And, and then they, they choose to come. Um, for the racial equity piece, I think most important of what we do with this group is to have such a positive, strong, um, exciting collaboration that we're actually working to get people that, so that they are interested in doing it. Because being very honest, I, there, there's some hesitation because people don't know what, what this, you know, what it's about and what's going on. And so, um, and there's some preconceived notions too that come with participation. So I think it's really crucial that what we do with this is inclusive to everybody. Um, and so that we get everybody excited to participate and want to be part of it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, so we are going to turn briefly to what's next and, and what to expect. Um, and a, a key component of that is for you to start to think about what specific areas of this plan are you feeling really moved and motivated to engage with, to um, uh, inform, participate in, and there will be a multitude of opportunities to do so between now and the next time we meet, and then obviously moving forward from there. And uh, we wanted to share a little bit about um, what you can expect in these spaces as this is an iterative process uh, along the way. And so Casey, I'm happy to voice some of these over and you can chime in, or if you wanna jump in, 
whichever you feel. Okay, cool. Um, so the phrase par baked is one that um, I, I introduced to SACOG and, and that's to say uh, that because this is meant to be a working group of recipro a reciprocal space, because we want to ensure that your perspectives are incorporated along the way, um, don't necessarily expect fully baked things to come to uh, to come to you all, right? We want to leave enough room for you to weigh in, contribute your perspectives, and really shape what implementation looks like. And so we're using the phrase par baked versus fully baked uh, to, to really emphasize that uh, that there are meant to be a multitude of opportunities for you to engage, for you uh, to shape this work moving forward. That second bullet point really emphasizes that please weigh in with your unique perspectives. You have already done an incredible, incredible job of modeling that uh, thus far. Looking forward to hearing uh, the multitude of voices uh, in this working group. So as, as we proceed through these meetings, for those of you who haven't um, uh, had a chance to contribute your perspectives thus far, um, please look for those opportunities. You're, you're here because we know that you have something meaningful to contribute. Um, we want you to be able to, again, provide feedback and advice to, to the staff of SACOG. You've already done that, so like keep it up. Um, uh, we've seen uh, that even uh, in these early stages. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, you'll be making recommendations to the SACOG board on um, moving uh, this work forward. Casey, do you wanna add anything on that last point or James or anyone else about the mechanism of that? I will, um, well, two two things that I hadn't thought of, um, Danielle, when we put this together. So every time this working group meets, um, we summarize uh, what you've all discussed and the feedback we've received, and then that goes into a staff report to the full board. And then the chair of this working group, Chair Jennings, gives a report out to the board. So that is, uh, at a minimum, an update on our progress uh, over uh, over the time that we're together. And then um, some specific things where you'll uh, be providing recommendations to the board, you'll be receiving um, progress reports. Uh, you had a verbal one today. Uh, we hope to actually have uh, some work with you on some documenting of um, our progress um, so that you can look at uh, the breadth of what is happening so far. Um, and in these working groups, we hope that what we're striving to do is give you enough um, information, you know, getting your hands on the work so that when you see progress reports, you want you you understand what you're looking at and then can give, um, to, you know, provide recommendations ultimately to the board, whether it's at the end of this year or in next year, for sure by the end of your two years here on any um, changes that may need to be made to the action plan to make it more effective. That's um, that's literally written into the action plan is your charge. <laughs> uh, so again, like your questions and your your engagement in this is very important to that ultimate thing. And the board may, you know, you may make recommendations like you need to change a goal or, you know, you gotta, you know, change some objectives or add some things, right? Um, so that's, that's what we're looking for. Back to you, Danielle. Thank you. And William, I saw you come off mute. Did you wanna chime in at all? Oh no, that was a mistake, I'm sorry. <laughs> I try and be a good online facilitator and see uh, see when people come off mute. Okay, um, so how to engage. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list, but we wanted to lift up um, a couple of, of early ways to get engaged. Uh, so there's an opportunity if, again, one of those uh, objectives really like piques your interest, uh, you have an opportunity to engage on those individual objectives if you want to sink your teeth in a bit further. And so you can re reach out to the SACOG team um, to let them know that you're really interested in, in digging in here or there or everywhere, hopefully. Um, and uh, we will be hosting a number of additional um, sessions hyper-focusing in on certain REI topics. And so you have an opportunity to participate in those between now and the next meeting, which is in um, several unfortunately, several months. Uh, Casey, do you want to say anything more on, on that uh, second bullet point? I think you've got it. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, so the topics of those are TBD. Um, we are um, seeking your interest and in what you'd like to dig into more deeply. The, the focus there being um, uh, continuing to build and deepen uh, knowledge, connection. If there are topics that you'd like to deep dive into that would help make you more effective on the working group, that's kind of what we're envisioning for these spaces. And that's actually a great segue to the last thing that we'll talk about, um, which is what do you need to be successful? Um, so I'll just open it up for a few um, comments and invite you to share more by email if we don't get to you. Um, but we're talking everything from meeting time and day to uh, facilitation approaches to information that you want ahead of time. Um, would really just love to hear, what do you need to be successful? We want you to be able to show up and, and lean in and really lead this work. Um, and so what's coming up for you right now? Are you able to provide the slides for this particular presentation? You, you want them before or after or both? Uh, well, Preferably before, but at least after. <laughs> for sure after. Daniel, could I chime in? This is Lynette. Could I yeah. chime in there just for a second? Uh, just to make sure all the working group members know that following each meeting, uh, I do go onto the website and I post the PowerPoint presentation. Thank so you. you can access it there, or you can always just send me an email and I'm happy to send those along too. Whatever's more convenient. Thank you. Go ahead, Ravel. Yeah, thank you. So, so maybe um, in terms of what the group might need, maybe, maybe it's a sort of what we've gotten a taste of already and sort of the support that we've received, right? And so as um, folks demonstrate interest on a specific objective or a, a specific area, like having sort of that backbone support to facilitate conversation, I think having materials you know, a few days in advance. So we have a chance. I think one of our group agreements was uh, uh, to come prepared and, and be present. And so I think uh, having those two things sort of, uh, you know, some some level of backbone support and maybe for those um, uh, sort of smaller work groups, maybe even like a, a small sort of short, uh, maybe charter, right? So so that we also understand like, you know, what, what, what are the parameters around our participation? I think you, you talked about sort of uh, bringing forward sets of recommendations of the full board. It's really helpful to, to continue to have that uh, in mind. So uh, th those would be my uh, re recommendations. So thank you. Thank you. Others that stand out? Go ahead, Darren. Thanks. Now, I first, uh, I want to agree with Raul and Secondly, um, your ongoing facilitation. <laughs> I think you do a great job in, in uh, making sure everyone uh, stays engaged. So definitely you continuing. And then all, all, all of us coming together and, um, you know, maybe there's opportunities for, um, you know, personal dialogue or, you know, dialogue amongst the group. And we, we have, we have um, topics that we're, pointing at or coming on topic but maybe if there's you know ways we can interact with one another i feel like that would be helpful thank you Love that. that's great thank you james yeah danielle this maybe not quite responded at the prompt but i but i it, as rogel was speaking um you know it's really nice to have a number of you and you know who you are who are working for local government on and this working group and then those of you who are elected officials, right? Because I think one of the tensions is around where are the elected officials on the elected body, right? On the board, where's all the staff? And sometimes there's gaps, right? There's gaps on everything we do. And so we really wanted to have some of our local staff here to really kind of almost chime in and sort of say, well, I can tell you from a staff perspective, you know, this would be really helpful. Or we've tried this in our agency or our county or our city. Uh, and then I think, also for our elected officials on this working group, it'd be great to sort of listen in that way and think a little bit about like, how else can I be supportive in my own jurisdiction, right? What, what, cause, cause you know, um, Director Soon, we had a great, I had a great meeting with Jason Beerman, your city manager. And I know Elk Grove has been doing a lot, right? Around diversity and inclusion um, for very good reason, right? But we have to, we have to sort of support each other. That is one of the goals in the, 
in the racial equity action plan. But I also just want us to be, since since I think we're entering all of this with a sort of a, a directness and an honesty and all those values that you all ascribed in the last meeting, uh, I just really want to put on the table how important it is to have this kind of staff, external partner and elected official, right, interaction, because it's fertile. It's really, it's really important and it's fertile ground. So, so I, I want to ask all of that uh, from all of you, really, because <laughs> I think it'll help us, right? We, we we try to enter all of our work, but especially around racial equity with humility. Like we are learning. We are learning from many other people who have come before us and are doing more and have done more. Um, but we also know we can't do it alone. And so we want to create a cohort in this region, right? Because it is it's so important for our region to be a better place and to, to have stronger jurisdictions. So I just want to throw that on the table. Thank you. And I think what we can maybe mesh together um, in those last two points is there are likely opportunities to cross pollinate what's happening in the region with one another. And so we can build in time to really allow you all to be in conversation with one another and bring some stories and and um, strategies from your own uh, jurisdictions into the space to share with one another as well. Um, I wanna hand it over to Chair Jennings to close us out. I wanna respect everybody's time. It's very late on a Friday. Chair Jennings, you wanna wrap us up? Absolutely, absolutely. Big round of applause for our facilitator or you can snap your fingers or you can throw up your emojis and all that kind of stuff. She had high energy. She kept us engaged and involved. And I just want to let her know she did a great job. So good job on that. How about our staff who, who did a lot of work, James and, and Casey and the rest of our staff for another big round of applause and all kinds of emojis and love. Love to all of you for keeping us uh, going. And then to each Lynette one of you. And Robert. <laughs> and Robert. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Uh, each one of you, the participants, the board members, the working uh, group, um, I couldn't ask for a better group who came together on a Thursday afternoon from 1 to 3 p.m. after a tough morning to come together and have a long meeting like this for two hours. And we kept your attention. You were involved. You were engaged. You gave us some great points. I can't tell you how many times I heard staff says, that's a great question, <laughs> right? So that means you gave them the questions, the tough questions that made them think and made them be able to come back prepared with a great answer. So I'm excited about this group. I told you that if you don't know your potential, you are a take it to the house potential type working group. You take it to the house. And I'm glad to be a part of you as well. Uh, I wanna make sure that you know, if you didn't see it on your agenda, our next meeting dates are June the 29th from two to 4 p.m. And then on October 26th, from 3 to 5 p.m. So I want you to put that on your calendar so you know when that's going to happen. I want to also let you know that staff is always available. Our staff, our facilitator, our executive director, they're always, myself, we're always available for any questions that you have in between now and the next meeting. So don't feel like you got to ask all your questions at the meeting. You can just, and Casey, I think I mentioned Casey as well, um, but don't think you got to wait to the next meeting to get your questions answered. S staff is always available to, to, to be able to do that and, and, and give you the help you need. So again, just want to thank you. want you to have a wonderful weekend coming up and uh, look forward to seeing each and every one. All those who are going to Cap and Cap, we're going to go there and change the world. We're going to go there and let them know that Sacramento is in the house. We're going to drop the mic. So thank you so much. I'm done. Chair Jennings, you, just, just landed. I'm here. Come on down. I'm ready. All right. Man, that's <laughs> what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next Thanks, time. Thanks, everyone. All right, everybody. Thank Thanks. You. Bye. Have a good weekend.